Well, welcome. It is uh, Wednesday, the 18th of June. I know that because it's my anniversary. So uh, it's a great day. Um, How many years? 26. 26. So today we'll be finishing up the last little bit on joints and then moving into a little bit of discussion on muscle. Uh, again, uh, these two lectures, Monday and Wednesday's lecture, will give you the content for Monday's exam. That exam will be a full-length exam. You'll need a Scantron form for that. And uh, for the hybrid students who are listening, uh, you'll be able to take it in the testing center on Monday or Tuesday, and I'll be sending out an email with those details. The um, vocabulary on that is 41 through 50, correct? So that means when we get to 50, we're halfway through the course. I mean, we are at that midpoint. We're at the lab exam for halfway. We're at the, the third exam out of six. So we really are at the midpoint in the course. So let's get through the vocab, and then I'll ask if there are any questions related to the exam. So juxta. Uh, juxta means near. Uh, so we'll see when we get to the kidney structures called juxta glomerular. They're near uh, structures within the kidney. Uh, cal, uh, you may know that potassium, uh, the symbol for potassium is K, and uh, hyperkalemia would be a high level of calcium, sorry, a high level of potassium in the blood. Carry, nucleus, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, uh, you'll see that karyo term referring to the nucleus, and carrot, K-E-R-A-T, referring to the cornea. We saw that a kyphotic or kyphosis is a hump-like change in the vertebra. Uh, labi meaning lip. Laceration. If you have a laceration, you have a tear or a cut. So lacera, meaning a tear or a cut, torn. And lacrimo, referring to your tears. Your lacrimal glands are your tear producers, and you've seen the lacrimal bone, uh, which is sitting uh, near the lacrimal duct. Lacto, milk. Pretty straightforward. Lactose is milk sugar. Lamina, you've seen lamella, and we've seen that word lamina before, meaning layer. Lapar meaning ab the abdomen. If you have a laparoscopy, then you are having a viewing of your abdominal cavity. Uh, lati means broad. So the lat latissimus dorsi we know is a broad, big old broad muscle of the back. And then finally for today, uh, lemma, a rind or a peel. We'll see that term today in the muscle. Uh, lepsy, a seizure. Uh, so epilepsy, ep Epilepsy literally means seizure upon seizure upon seizure. Uh, we've got let meaning small and leuco meaning white. Now there's a change here though, right? Your slides only go through let and leuco picks up on 51, correct? Right, but this on our 49 has later. You have ladder? Okay, ladder. so I need to pull up a different presentation. So you have ladder meaning lateral to the side. Mm -hmm. So you've got that extra term and you don't have leuco and I'll get that corrected, but I'll only go off your list from your... Um, supplement for the exam. So just 41 through 50 for the exam on Monday. So we spent some time looking at skeletal system. We went back and reviewed the structures of a long bone, talked a little bit about flat bones, uh, talked about the different cells found in bone, osteo, osteoprogenitor cells, which are there as stem cells that make more osteoblasts. The osteoblasts are the cells that are going to make new bone. After they've made new bone and cocooned themselves within that matrix, we now call them osteocytes. That's all involved with the building and maintenance of blood or of bone. And then there are other cells, osteoclasts, which are there to chew up the bone. And by doing so, they're releasing calcium and phosphate and helping with the maintenance and the homeostasis. And your bone is always changing. It's always being built and broken down. The word we use for building is to deposit, or the bone is being deposited. There's deposition occurring and absorption or reabsorption, uh, or absorption of the bone for breaking down of the bone. Looked at a few structures, uh, tried to highlight any bone uh, markings along the way. Reminded you again what it looks like under the microscope with the canaliculi and the lacunae and and the osteon structures. What else? Is there anything else in that conversation from Monday that I can restate for you or clarify? Okay. Well, we were also uh, about halfway through 
the presentation on joints and we discussed the three different types of anatomic joints, fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial joints. We went through some of the different common movements that the joints can provide for us. And that brought us to really the next, I don't know, 20 or so slides or a quick view through some of the more important joints in the body. What's important as we go through this, there's a lot more detail on these slides than what you're responsible for. What you're responsible for is just knowing the joint, knowing where in the body it is and what bones are coming together. And then any bone markings that are in that area, and I'll highlight those as we go through this. Now there'll be a lot of ligaments in these images. Remember, a ligament is a dense, regular connective tissue structure that connects a bone to a bone. And we've only, you know, we really haven't named any ligaments. So you're not responsible for any additional structures here than what weren't already covered in the lab. So a lot of this is kind of a kickback, make a few notes about bone markings or a few key things, but most of this is just kind of an appreciation that when we look at the skeleton in the lab, we don't get a full view of the complexity. We just see this humerus next to the scapula and we kind of wonder, well, how in the world do these things hang out together? What is it that holds them together? That's where I want us to understand the complexity, not to know it all, but just to appreciate it at this point. So TMJ, the temporomandibular joint, this is your chewing joint. Uh, this first word here, diarthrosis, means that it's a freely moving joint. All of these are synovial, freely moving joints. And in fact, the TMJ is actually two synovial joints side by side, one that allows side to side motion and one that allows an up and down. And there's also some rotational pivot movement in there as well. And what I want you to see is that everything that's white in these uh, images, everything that's white um, within the joint, all this white stuff is going to be cartilage. Okay. And you can see there's actually two joints here in one. The blue areas are fluid-filled regions. Uh, there's always fluid around these synovial joints. There's a synovial membrane in there, a layer of, of epithelial cells that helps to maintain this fluid-filled sac. And really what I want you to appreciate again is that this is the temporal bone coming in contact with the mandible. And then I'll point out the, the bone markings that we know and love. So this is the styloid process. It's already marked for us. This opening, external, external acoustic or external auditory meatus, a tube-like passageway. And this is part of the mastoid process. And that exhausts everything we need to worry about. And then I wanted you to appreciate, too, that when you're looking at that styloid process, it's there for a reason that there are, in this case, there's a ligament that is there to stabilize the jaw and the entire head. And that's pretty much it uh, that I want you to know about the TMJ. Now we get to the glenohumeral joint. You've seen that term before. It is the coming together of the humerus with the glenoid cavity. You know it as the shoulder, but we'll call it the glenohumeral joint. It's a ball and socket joint. It's coming, or it's a combination of the head of the humerus coming into the glenoid cavity of the scapula. This joint is the one in our body with the greatest range of motion. But as I mentioned last time, that greater range of motion comes with a price. That is, it is the least stable. So there are more issues with this joint than others. A lot of the strength of the shoulder comes from muscles we have not yet learned this semester, nor will we this semester. But the rotator cuff muscles, the infraspinatus, the supraspinatus, and we'll deal with those next semester. There's a term here that I alluded to in our vocab, uh, the bursa, okay, bursa. And um, remember that bursa, I told you, meant a purse. Another way of thinking about it is that it's really a gel pack. I think of these bursa as being gel packs, fluid-filled gel packs that help to protect the joint space. And let's take a look at this. The bright blue structures here are bursa. So you're not responsible for naming them, but you see these fluid-filled gel packs. They're part of the joint space. They're protecting everything. We see the clavicle. 
and we can see now the clavicle is coming into contact with what? This is the tip of the shoulder, so that is the acromion, and this other would be the coracoid. We've got that down. Uh, this would be the humerus coming down, and we can't even see really the joint space because it's, it's being covered up here by a bunch of ligaments and tendons that are helping to provide support and structure for the overall joint. You will see here, though, that the biceps brachii right, are, is coming up, the muscle's coming up, and there's the tendon for it, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, because that the biceps brachii, you know, originates up in the armpit area and goes up into the glenoid cavity. Let's look at this from, from straight on. So now you're looking at uh, this space. We've never seen cartilage here before, but that is the humerus looking on it straight from the lateral view. And here we can see a nice layer of cartilage. It makes sense, right, because the glenoid cavity would have some hyaline cartilage there to allow smooth movement of the head of the humerus. And again, you're, you're sort of overwhelmed by these bursa, these fluid-filled packs, as well as a bunch of tendons and ligaments that are supporting this overall joint. When you look at it like this, uh, now what you can see again, here's the cartilage. Right? We've got the cartilage. That'd be the regular old hyaline cartilage along the head of the humerus. There would also be that cartilage inside right, the glenoid cavity. The, the purple in this case would be the fluid-filled synovial space right, between the cartilage. It's going to allow for lubrication and keep the joint moving nicely. And then here you can see the, the deltoid comes up or the shoulder muscle comes up into here. And here, um, I guess that's all we need to worry about right now. The blue on this would be the bursa again. You're not, you're not going to label that, but I want you to appreciate the complexity of these joint spaces. Another joint to know about is the radial carpal joint. If I said, where's your radial carpal joint, you would say, oh, it must be between the radius and the carpals. That would be your wrist. Um, there's actually three little carpal bones that interface directly with the radius. The ulna, surprisingly, is not really part of your wrist. It's one step removed, and you'll see that in a moment. And the combination of all these bones allows for quite a bit of motion, but would you agree your wrist is not 360, right? It's not, an, it's not as ball and socket-like as your shoulder. There are some limitations to the movement. So collectively, all those uh, carpals and the metacarpals are allowing for quite a bit of motion, but it's not completely free in all directions. I think it's amazing when you look at all these little carpals, and we haven't named any of them, but you notice that every one of these carpal bones has a layer of cartilage around it, and every one of them has little ligaments that connect the bones one to another. Is it any wonder why we need hand specialists, right? Doctors who do nothing but hand surgery because of the complexity of these little ligaments, the, the muscles, the bones, and the synovial spaces that are found. Here is the, um, the actual coming together of the radius and the carpals. And notice that the, the ulna is actually removed just a little bit uh, through another big chunk of cartilage. So it doesn't have direct connection quite like the radius sides, the radius sides does. Next, we go to the elbow. You would know it as the uh, humeral ulna and the humeral radial joints. Again, it's a free-moving joint. You know that it's a hinge joint. It's the coming together, and these are terms you know. There's the trochlear notch of the ulna coming into proximity with the trochlea of the humerus. There's also the capitulum of the humerus coming in contact with the head of the radius. So a nice hinge joint, uh, very stable. It really is. It's intermediate, isn't it? It's right in the middle of that continuum of stability and mobility. So we take a look at it, and you can't even see uh, you know, the bones because, of, again, all the covering of the uh, structures with the ligaments. But you can see the humerus coming down. And what you definitely can see is there's that rounded head of the radius. It would be coming in contact with the capitulum and the trochlea of the 
ulna here, which would allow for it to be the hinge joint. Looking at it from the side, uh, what bone markings do we need to know here? This is the, sorry, that roughened area on the radius is the radiotuberosity, and to that spot, we know that is the tendon for the biceps brachii muscle. Uh, this point right here would be called the what? The olecranon, right, the tip of the elbow. And what would this be? What would that tendon be? Yeah, triceps brachii, right? Remember, the triceps brachii comes around the ulna and inserts onto the olecranon. Again, looking at it from the side, the olecranon here, the trochlear notch, and the trochlea. Radio tuberosity over here. The coxal, yeah. Bone spurs, it could be a fracture, it could be, your bones are constantly, the question is what causes bone spurs? Um, it can be a, a fracture, it could be a, a stress fracture of some sort. It could also just be that when the bones are remodeling, that they remodel a little bit inappropriately, and so they're creating some bone where they shouldn't be, that can create some spur-like structures within a joint space. Um, your bones are constantly being fractured, micro fractures, right, as they're being as they're being broken down and re, reformed, if you will. So um, any of those things could cause some bone spurs of sorts. Yeah. Very uncomfortable, though, if they're in the wrong place. Uh, the coxal joint, we know this one to be the hip joint. We know it's the head of the femur coming into articulation with the acetabulum of the os coxa. It is stronger than the other uh, ball and socket joint. It's stronger than the glenohumeral joint. It has to be because it is going to support our entire body weight. And there are lots of directions and movements because this is a uh, ball and socket multi-axial joint. Looking at it, let's do some bone markings while we're here. This would be the greater trochanter. Well, actually, all this. This would be the lesser trochanter. Um, right here would be the pubis symphysis or the symphysis pubis uh, right here. Obturator foramen. Uh, on the roughened side down here would be the ischial tuberosity. Good. Um, we can't even see, right? We can't even see the, the neck or the head of the femur, and it would be sitting into the what? Into the acetabulum. Good. Now we can see the, now we can see the, the side with the actual tuberosity on the ischium, and again, the lesser trochanter, the greater trochanter. In 106, we'll, we'll break this down. We'll look at the hip, the shoulder, and the knee with a lot greater detail. We'll learn the ligaments. We'll learn a lot more of the structures that are supporting these joint spaces. Um, really not much more to say here. Again, you're, just, you're seeing all these ligaments, even one that's in the acetabulum. You might think that there's nothing in here, but there's actually a, another ligament in here that actually helps to pull and rotate and support the overall hip. The knee joint, it's actually two separate articulations, uh, one uh, between the tibia and the femur, the tibiofemoral, and the other between the patella and the femoral. And um, I do want you to know, maybe I lied a moment ago, there are two ligaments that I want you to know. These are the only two ligaments that I'm adding, uh, and we hear about them every day. You can't turn on ESPN or the news without hearing about some athlete or some person has ruptured or torn out their ACL or their PCL. So let's just make sure we know what those two ligaments are. They're in the knee. I think we know that. Uh, the ACL, well, first of all, what does cruciate mean? The anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate ligament. What does cruciate mean? Cruciate means that they cross over. Okay, Cruci crux or cross. Okay, so the cruciate ligament is, is, are these ligaments that cross over. I'll show you a picture in a moment. The ACL is there to prevent your over or your hyperextension of the knee. A person who blows out their ACL, uh, a soccer player uh, kicking, right, and, and they overextend, they hyperextend their knee, and it goes beyond the limit, and that ligament gets snapped as a result. 
The PCL is there to do the opposite. The PCL is there to prevent hyperflexion. Right? There's only so far you should be able to, to flex your leg, and it's possible to overflex it. And imagine you're on a teeter-totter, and the person on the other end thinks it's funny, and they, and they jump off, right? And your leg's underneath you, and you come down, right? And you, you really hyperflex it. You don't hear about the PCL as much, but you definitely hear about the ACL all the time. So just know what these two ligaments are there for. The ACL to prevent hyperextension of the knee and the PCL to prevent hyperflexion of the knee. You can't see them here, but there are a couple things here you need to recognize. Here's the femur. Coming down are all the tendons of the quadriceps femoris muscles. We're looking at the anterior view. And all of those muscles are coming down and attaching to what? Right, the tibial tuberosity, good. <clears throat> Looking at it from a, from a sagittal cut, you can see the little patella right here. And again, here are the quadriceps femoris muscles coming down and around the patella and inserting onto the tibial tuberosity. In the knee, there's a big chunk of cartilage called the meniscus. You're not responsible for that right now, but that's what wears down with people when they need re knee replacements is typically that big chunk of cartilage that starts to wear down. Now you've got bone on bone, very painful articulations of the knee. Let's take a look at those ligaments. You're looking at this from the, from, um, you're seeing the condyles, right? So these big, big condyles right here. You recognize the condyles. And back here, there's the anterior, and behind it, the posterior cruciate ligament. You see how they cross over each other. So you're looking at this from the, from the front. There's your tibial tuberosity. And you're seeing the anterior crossing and the posterior back behind it. And again, from the, from the side here, actually, this is more from the back, uh, posterior view. So those big condyles on the posterior side of the femur and the anterior cruciate ligament there and the posterior here. So you see again the crossing over of them. There are a lot of other ligaments in the knee that we'll discuss next semester. Last one, the talocrural joint is your ankle joint. Remember that the, the uh, cruel region was the leg and the talus, right, coming down on the talus. This is the, the joint that allows you to dorsiflex your foot and to plantar flex your foot, those two motions I mentioned of the ankle. And it's actually two articulations, uh, the distal end of the tibia going to the talus, as well as the distal end of the fibula that is connecting to a portion of the talus as well. So I'm even more amazed by the complexity of the foot. I mean... You don't have doctors, you have doctors who become hand specialists, but our foot specialists go to school for do nothing but the foot, right, podiatrists. And so these individuals, they have to appreciate all of these little ligaments. I mean, look at it. It's, it's just this minefield of complexity. When you think of it, all these ligaments that are holding all those little tarsal bones together, and those tarsals are obviously are supporting much of the weight of our foot. There's a ligament down here that gives some people some trouble. Right? If anyone has any trouble down here, you might have what condition? Plantar fasciitis, right? That, that idea where every step it hurts, uh, that tendon, that ligament gets really, really tight down there. They can get to the point where they have to snap it uh, or, or cut it. And it's more of a problem with flat feet. So you can imagine it's being stretched more, but it also helps to keep your arch, right? So something that uh, maybe some of you have had to deal with. Uh, what is this bump right here? We're on the fibula, so that is the lateral malleolus. And if I could see it, the other side would be the medial malleolus coming from the tibia. Here you can really see the nice, the tibia coming down onto, that, uh, onto the talus. And then, like I said, the fibula coming down, and it also is articulating with a portion of the talus. There's your calcaneus, right? We know that. And what's back here? Yeah, the Achilles tendon or the calcaneal tendon, and that goes to what muscle? 
Gastrocnemius, right, absolutely. So that was one of your six muscles to have an appreciation of their insertion and origins. So then just a side view again, uh, to see the calcaneus, you can really see that the ligaments under the bottom of the foot that help to keep the arch of the foot. And that's about all you need to appreciate there. So that's just a really quick run through, through you know, five or six really common joints in the body, giving you just a glimpse of their complexity. Again, you just want to focus on the bone markings and knowing what bones are coming together, the things that I highlighted. Okay, the last little bit of this. We, I told you before that when bones fracture, that there's a hematoma, a blood clot, and then the osteoclasts come in and clean up the damage, and then the bone is reformed first through spongy bone and then to compact bone. Let's talk about some different common fractures of bones. Uh, what, what we, there's, there's a lot more than just the few that I'm going to share with you. But if you're told you have a simple fracture, it means that the bone is broken, but the skin was not broken. So the bone was broken internally, but it never stuck out of the body. If instead you're told you have a compound fracture, it's saying to you that the bone broke, and oh, by the way, the bone stuck out through the skin uh, in, the, in the process. So that's a compound fracture. So when I broke my, my tibia, I mean, it was sticking out, you know, 90, 90 degrees off to the side. So that definitely had a compound fracture. Now, a green stick fracture, and the name kind of tells you, it's also called an incomplete fracture. But if you're told, if you're going camping and you're going to go out and get some sticks, and you want the dry, brittle sticks, right, to start the kindling, but if you get a green stick, something that's not dead, and you go to snap it, what happens? It doesn't snap, it just kind of bends, right? It, it, it doesn't completely separate. And that's what I think of a green stick fracture as an incomplete fracture, and the bone is not completely separated uh, when it happens. Let's just take a look at these images. So this would be a simple fracture, right? It's, it's inside the body. Um, this would be uh, a compound fracture where now the bone uh, has stuck out through the skin, creating an even big, bigger, bloodier mess. And then here you can appreciate a green stick fracture. So there is a fracture, but it didn't break on one side. So you have a concave edge, and it did not snap completely. So that's an incomplete or a green stick fracture. Would they reset a green stick? Absolutely. They would reset it. Absolutely. They would reset it, and, and, and they're going to respond. They didn't completely break through, so it's, it's already you know, partially connected. So it's going to peel really, really well. Now, there's some other terms we can use here when describing a, a fracture. Transverse straight line, think transverse or cross section, so straight across. Uh, it could be a spiral fracture. Now, a spiral fracture is oftentimes sort of a, a warning for the emergency room because a spiral fracture is what is seen when a person um, oftentimes is abused. Now, it can happen. I mean, a spiral fracture can happen if you're a gymnast and, and you're coming down from a twisting motion, and as you land, you're in a twisting motion that bone can break in a spiral pattern. Or if you're in some sort of accident where you were twisting through the air as you fell. But it's also the kind of fracture seen when someone twists someone's arm until it breaks, okay, or twists a leg. So this is a, a, oftentimes a, a, a sign to an emergency room doctor that there could potentially have been some child abuse or some sort of abuse involved. An oblique fracture is one that's going to be at an oblique angle, at a diagonal angle. And then finally, comminuted means that the bone shattered into three or more pieces. Right? So just a fracture is two pieces. Three or more pieces we'll call a comminuted fracture. So let's go back and, and use these words then. So this fracture, it's a complete fracture. It's all the way across. But what other word could I use to describe this? It looks kind of transverse, right? Uh, this one appears to be incomplete, also called a, a green stick. Here I have multiple fragments, so that'd be comminuted. Now, is that going to heal back all on its own? No. That, that, that kind of fracture, you can't just put the two pieces together or all the pieces and expect them to grow properly. That's going to be plates and pins and a lot more going on. Um, spiral, you can kind of appreciate that it's in a spiral pattern over here. Here's an oblique fracture. 
I didn't mention impact fracture, but not uncommon in an auto accident. I mean, if you're driving and you've got your leg out, right, on the accelerator, and you have an impact, then it's very easy to imagine the, the, the head or the neck of the femur snapping, right, uh, that narrow region. So that's, not un, that's just an impact fracture here. So those are the terms. So let's go back and, and apply these terms. What other terms could I use to describe the fracture on the left? It's simple, but it's also transverse, whereas this one is both compound and oblique. Okay, so we could use a couple different words to describe those fractures. So here you can see another common place. I mean, here the hip has been, quote, broken, a broken hip. Now, sometimes it's at the neck. Here it was sort of at the greater trochanter. But either way, there's been a fracturing here and uh, not an uncommon break there in the hip. Now, who's breaking their bones? Right. Who here has had a fracture? Raise your hand. So about half of you or maybe a third of you have experienced some sort of break and more than likely we're in some sort of cast for, for four, six, eight weeks. The younger folks in the world, right, under 65, what are they doing? Under 65, lots of arms and legs. Makes sense, right? We're falling, doing crazy things. Um, not very many head injuries or skull injuries, but a lot more than in older folks, right? You know, downhill skiing and, and snowboarding and things where more head injuries are po possible and not very many hips. And the elderly, and this just makes sense, a lot more hips, right? And not as many arms and legs, although quite a few because as older folks fall, they try to brace their fall with their arm and that can lead to wrist fractures and other arm problems. And folks over 65 aren't doing too much downhill skiing, so they don't have quite as many skull fractures, thankfully. This is my reminder slide that I want you to be able to connect what's going on with the skeletal system with other body systems. And every time uh, from this point on, on the exam, including Monday, there'll be a couple of questions. And it will basically say this. The skeletal system interacts with what other system, blank, and the interaction is as follows, or something like that. So, I want you to appreciate that our body systems are not working in a vacuum. They're not in isolation. So what, how does the skeletal system interact with your other body systems? And they're listed here. So pretty obvious. Um, I told you that, you know, obviously our skeleton interacts with our muscles. Uh, clearly, and there's more than just these, but clearly our skeletal system protects our nervous system, right? Our, our skeletal system, our skull protects our brain. That one's really easy. Um, we need vitamin D for our bones to be healthy, so our skin's involved with making sure we have plenty of vitamin D. Our digestive system also is absorbing calcium for building our bones. You know, the, the ribs are protecting the, the lungs and the respiratory muscles. You get the idea. Right? So I, I want you to be able to articulate or to write down uh, some connections. So look at a list like this. Think of two or three of them and just remember them. It's not hard. Just how does the skeletal system interact with, protect, uh, depend upon, influence other body systems? And that'll be a little bit of a fill in the blank section. Really quick, just a sentence or two. How does this system interact with others? On the test on Monday, there'll be another one that says, how does the muscular system interact with other systems? Okay? And so on exam three, there'll be a question about the skeletal and a question about the muscular systems. I'll also finish every system uh, with a slide about what happens as the system ages. So what do we have to look forward to? Right? So osteopenia would be a deficiency in bone. Openia is a deficiency. So your bones will, over time, become more thin and weaker. That's because the bones will have less ossification and there'll be less mineralization. So the osteoblasts just don't build as much bone as we get older. And as a result, our mass will decline and the bones become more porous. Well, when the bones become more porous, 
we're talking about like osteoporosis, right? They have larger openings, less density, especially in the spongy bone on the inside. Now, where a lot of this osteopenia will be obvious is in the vertebra. So people shrink, right? There'll be a little bit of, of shortening, a little bit of space, a little bit less space between the cartilage between each of your vertebra. So you've got 24 vertebra, you've got 24 little intervertebral discs or pads between the vertebra. If each of those only loses, right, a millimeter, that's 2.4 centimeters, that's an inch, right? So it's very easy to imagine a person losing an inch in their height as they get older. I know I'm down about an inch. Um, the jaw bones start having problems or having some of this osteopenia, the, tooth, the teeth become more loose. Right, those gonfoses, those connections between the teeth and the jaw become larger spaces. Um, and also, when one falls, their bones are more brittle and more acceptable, uh, susceptible to fracture. The articulating surfaces can de deteriorate, leading to arthritic changes and painful movement, uh, especially osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is, as the name suggests, bone, right? Bone in the, in the joint space. So this is when that articulating cartilage wears down, and now you've got bone rubbing on bone, right? Very painful. And these changes in our skeleton are not just something that we have to look forward to in our old age. Our skeleton's changing now, and it has been changing and will continue to change throughout our lifespan. Calcium is really, really important for women um, at age 35, for sure, and for 45 for men. So ladies, make sure you're getting supplements for calcium. And that's also important, of course, during pregnancy as well. Looking at these images, now this is a little bit of a, pharmac a pharmacy company or a pharmacological company taking a little bit of leeway here, showing you what osteoporosis looks like. The problem is they've got a scan here at 20x and one at 30x. And they're saying, here's normal bone, and here's one with osteoporosis. Well, there are a little bit, little bit of marketing issues here, right? Because they're not showing apples and apples. But you can't appreciate, now this is spongy bone. This is not the bone we looked at under the microscope, right? This is that spongy bone. And that's where most of your osteoporotic changes occur. It's there that the bone has less density. So you can appreciate that there are bigger spaces, right, between the spongy bone sections. Now there are a lot of meds that we read about on commercials. Um, what's the new one? Boniva, and there's a few other ones that are coming out. And all of these medications basically, they do a few things, but one of the things that com uh, combine or, uh, connects them all is that they're going to interfere with osteoclast activity. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if we can slow down the osteoclast chewing away at the bone, then we can maintain our bone density longer. So all these drugs somehow interfere with osteoclast activity. Don't worry about the names of the drugs. It keeps changing. Talking about bones and changes over time. So I mentioned osteoarthritis. That's not the only type of arthritis. In fact, arthritis is a, a, an umbrella diagnosis that includes over 100 different diseases. But that's one of the more common ones. Look at the hands up in the upper right side. And what do you see there? Pretty deformed looking, right? Um, that would be an example of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, as is the picture down here below. I mean, look at the gross disfiguration of the joints. So that is the kind of arthritis you see more common in elderly women than men, and where the hands are grossly deformed, and you don't even want to shake hands with them, right? It looks like it's so painful. So that's rheumatoid arthritis. Now, this knee over here, if you look at an x-ray, there should be a nice, smooth space between the bones. And if you see a nice, smooth articulation area, then you assume there are no bone spurs, no problems, no breakdown of the cartilage. In this particular knee, there's a little bit of calcification right here, and maybe uh, you know there's some definitely some, some closer connections here than there is over here. Now, this person may not be complaining. This person, may, this person uh, even though their x-ray looks a little bit cloudy, uh, they may not be complaining of pain. Or the x-ray doesn't really look that bad, but they could really be complaining about a lot of pain. So we don't treat, the, 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 the phrase goes, we don't treat x-rays, 
right? We treat patients. And so you can have a patient who is complaining about a lot of pain as an arthritic change, and you look at their x-rays, and they look rather normal. And you can have other people whose x-rays look horrible, and they're saying, I don't notice any problems, right? So we don't treat x-rays, right? We treat the pain, the symptoms, as people come to us as clinicians. But arthritis is a, is a group of inflammatory or degenerative diseases, all of which include the joint, right? That's the arth part. Remember, arth means joint. So itis, inflammation of the joint, arthritis. So any condition that, that inflames or degenerates the joint space is under this arthritis uh, diagnosis. So here's a, a hand of rheumatoid arthritis. Look at her x-ray. I mean, it's just, it's painful to look at Look at this joint. I mean, the bones aren't even articulating properly, right? Imagine how painful that would be. You're no longer moving over articulating cartilage. You've got bone rubbing onto bone. And you can just see just how grossly deformed her joint spaces are. Now, that is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, again, one of, one of many. Now, arthritis is on the rise. I need to get a new figure here. Uh, by 2020, Right, it's anticipated that in, in Michigan, we're going to have over 18% of our population, right? That's not Michigan, that is. Um, but over 18% of our population, right, will have arthritis, and the numbers just keep going up. Uh, back in 1990, that was pretty much down in Florida. I don't understand the West Virginia thing, but Florida, you know, a lot of old folks living in a humid com uh, climate, you wouldn't be surprised by that. You don't see as much of it out west. Uh, because people live, move out there, it's a drier climate, they don't complain about it as much. They may have arthritis, but they're not complaining about the symptoms as much in the West. But we can see that even in 2020, it's expected that those numbers will be rising. There are a lot more people with, with arthritis than what are diagnosed. Now, arthritis is a chronic condition, right? It's a long-term, chronos, meaning time. It's a long-term condition. It is a le leading cause of disability in Americans second only to heart disease for, for missing work, and affects millions and millions of patients and results in billions um, of dollars in output. And those numbers are old. Don't worry about the numbers. Just know that this is a major you know, it, health issue in our country. What does the weather mean arthritis? The people can, a lot of people who have arthritis can predict the future. Um, <laughs> so moist uh, uh, humidity, increased humidity will actually lead to more aggravation of their symptoms. So people with really severe arthritis, sometimes it, it just it increases the fluid and the buildup. Um, and other people can, can uh, you know, they'll move out to Arizona if it's really, really bad with a dry climate and they just have fewer symptoms. Yeah, but people, can, people with arthritis can predict the, the changes in the weather. They would not be happy right now with this humid weather, right, with the rain. So, again, over 100 different diseases are part of arthritis. Men are a little bit more protected than women because a number of the arthritic conditions are autoimmune diseases, and women simply are prone to more of those autoimmune diseases than men. I want you to know these basic ones. So osteoarthritis. This is the basic kind of arthritis that all of us have look, have look, can look forward to. This does not uh, affect men more than women. This is normal breakdown of the cartilage, bone on bone changes, osteo, right? Osteoarthritis, doesn't matter, men or women. Most prevalent form. The rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease affecting women more, uh, where the body starts to actually effectively break down the joint spaces, leading to those gross changes. Now, there are some forms of arthritis that are more common in men. One of those is gout. Now, even gout has a commercial now. It has for a while. That guy walking around with a green Erlenmeyer flask, right? Um, so gout used to be considered a, a disease of kings. It, we know that it's a metabolic-type condition, um, and um, rich foods tend to uh, exasperate it. And gout, more often than not, settles in the big toe. So another, another proof that guys are wimps, right? Just a little bit of arthritis in the big toe, and they're like, they're out of it. But, but this can be treated primarily with medication. So it is more of a metabolic change in the big toe. Um, and there's, there's some pretty good meds out right now for gout. Now, these, uh, I don't want you to worry about the names of these, but I want you to appreciate, you probably have heard of lupus. And you probably have heard of scleroderma. And because these conditions do affect the joint spaces, they are under this arthritis 
classification, or even fibromyalgia. Right, so again, those three, lupus, scleroderma, and fibromyalgia, again, are more affecting women than men. So clearly, the number of women outranks men. Uh, there are other types of arthritis that affect certain parts of the body. For example, uh, ankylosing spondylitis is an arthritis that only affects the spine. Uh, so there are different types of arthritis where it's just the spine, just the toe, and other certain regions of the body. So last little bit on this chapter will be a, a couple things about limb malformations, uh, some terms that you want to know. So polydactyly, let's break that down. We know what dactyly means, digits, fingers, and toes. So polydactyly would be a person with more than five, right, six or seven digits. And so you can see up here in this person, right, uh, they've got an extra digit, if you will, off from their thumb. It may or may not be functional, but they have polydactyly. Um, then there's also syndactyly, or sorry, ectrodactyly. That would be a lacking of digits. That's the, the claw hand down here. So you can see this, this claw hand, so missing digits. Or there can be syndactyly, and you know that syn means where things come together. So that would be web fingers. So uh, there are some web fingers there, or here is a webbed toe. Now, what's, what didn't happen during development? What process did not happen? Right, apoptosis did not occur properly between the fifth and tenth week or so of development, and so those toes or those fingers were not properly separated during development. Last thing is just a little story. Um, amelia is, is a general condition for any loss of a limb. Now, I have no problem remembering that um, or forgetting that because I imagine Amelia Earhart suffered from Amelia. You guys know who Amelia Earhart is? Right? Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But she fell out of the sky, so I'm sure right, that she had a loss of limb. So easy to remember. Okay? Now, focal Amelia, that's horrible, I know, but it works. Focal Amelia is a flipper-like um, limb. And you see this guy here, or gal, um, and, and she's got little flipper-like right, arms and feet. And there, there was a whole group of individuals who in the late 50s and early 60s were born. Their mothers had been given a medication called thalilamide. Thalilamide was meant to curb nausea during those 6 to 12, those early weeks of pregnancy. And the moms were taking this drug, and it was effective in curbing nausea. But they started no noticing that their kids, some of them, were born with arms and legs that resemble this, okay, this focal amelia. And so they finally figured it out. Now, this drug really sort of helped to redefine medical testing. This drug had been tested on, on rabbits. It had been tested on, on mice and never showed any birth defects in those other little mammals. But it did specifically affect humans. And it was the first time where a medication had shown different effects in animals than it had in humans. So now we realize we couldn't just depend upon testing in animals when giving or testing for new drugs. We had to do clinical trials to really get it passed and to make sure it wasn't going to cause damage to individuals. So uh, the way this drug works, what we understand now, is that this drug blocked new blood vessels leading to the limb. So in other words, they're blocking what process? So like a word game, right? That's the process it's blocking, right? Angiogenesis, the formation of new vessels, angiogenesis. And that's what this drug was doing. Now, this drug is now used as a cancer treatment. Why? It blocks angiogenesis. What do tumors have to do to survive? They need to get their own blood supply. So if we can use this medication as part of a chemotherapy cocktail and slow down the ability of a tumor to gather its own blood vessel supply, then we can slow down the growth of that tumor. So we certainly wouldn't give it to pregnant women anymore because it causes birth defects. But it is or has been used to, um, again, be used in a chemo regimen to block new blood vessels from being formed.
So no thalidomide and um, recognize that it blocks angiogenesis. And that brings us to the end of that little chapter on joints. It's really sort of a, a, a special topics chapter. Uh, not all of those, not everything I went over with you is in your book. Um, so you definitely want to rely upon the PowerPoints as you're going through uh, this Chapter 9 stuff or this uh, joint stuff. You'll find that uh, it's more of a uh, highlights reel of different ideas, and some of it is not going to be covered in your book. So again, focus on your um, PowerPoints, and then if there's something from the PowerPoints that's not making sense, then you can refer to your book for clarification. So that's now two-thirds two-thirds of the material for the test, and it leaves us only with a little bit of information on muscle, and I assure you I never get through all this, so as I see you flipping through your pages, you're saying, Mac, you're crazy. We're not going to get through all this. In fact, I can tell you right now, we're only going to get through, I want to get through to the bottom of page 99. Okay, that's my goal. We'll see what happens in the next hour and 15 minutes. But my goal is to get down to the bottom of page 99 where you see the picture of the cat. So that's all we're going to cover, just that little bit uh, up until that. And it's about muscle. Some of this we've seen, a little bit of it we've seen in, in lab, and some of this will be new. So kind of kick back and uh, let it build on what you know. And as we get to something that's new, uh, wake back up and listen. Okay. So anything at all. Now, again, my chapters are off. Uh, this is 10 and 11. For you, it's 9 and 10. All right, we're off by 1 in your new martini book, your syllabus tells you correctly that this test covers chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? And 6 is the skeletal system, 7 is name that bone, 8 is joints, 9 is some muscle, and 10 in your book is name that muscle. So this is just a sort of a combination, again, it's a highlight reel of a few uh, important things about muscle. Anything at all right now? Questions from anything with the joint chapter or the skeletal chapter? Anything at all? Yes? It's not really a question, but um, going back to the humidity, I'm mm -hmm. in Florida, my aunt has scleroderma, and she has a pretty severe case of it. Mm -hmm. And she can't really bend, and her hands are like this. And we went to um, Florida over the summer, and she got in the ocean water. Interesting. But you can't do that in regular Warm water doesn't do it, but it, the salt water did something water. for her. Interesting. She had almost full range of movement. Nice. So now she's going to get a hot salt tub, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, scleroderma. Sclero means hard and derma. So in scleroderma, the skin becomes harder, more fibrous, and it can start affecting the internal organs as well. Um, but it's because it affects joints, right? Fibromyalgia, lupus, all of these conditions affect the joints, so they're considered part of the arthritic family. But I didn't, I'm not aware of that, because usually people with arthritis will go and sit in a warm pool, right, and do exercises there where they have some relief from the joint pain. But I wasn't aware of salt water having an effect. Right, so osteopenia is just a, a term that means a deficiency in bone, right? So there could have been some, you know, who knows, hormonal problem or a nutritional problem that was blocking normal bone production. Talk about, like, osteogenesis. No, we won't be talking about osteogenesis and perfected this semester, but I will be next semester. Just to, not much, but just a touch. Just a touch. Yes, ma'am? I'm glad you brought up the thing about treating the patient, not the x-ray. Right. Okay. And it's really bothering me. It's on the ear out, still bothering me. And the podiatrist keeps looking at the x ray, but well, the x ray looks good. And I'm like, I really don't care what that x ray looks like. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right. We don't, we don't treat x rays, right? Yeah, we, there's no, you can see that, I mean, before it was, it was touching and it caused that. And I wondered if she has a question about bone spurs. I wondered, can that be created by the bones touching? It, it can be, right? Because bones, bones respond to mechanical stress as I mentioned briefly, right? I said that vitamin A and mechanical stress are important. So if you're putting stress on a bone, it will cause it to become more active and perhaps create an abnormal, you know, portion or a spur-type structure. Uh, 
But it should show up in an x-ray. Well, that showed up, but okay. they, they removed the joint because it was so badly damaged. Correct, yes. They put an implant in there, and I was like, everything looks good. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, and, and podiatrists, I love them to death, but I, I'm afraid our feet are so complex that when they mess with them, they're never going to be quite the same. And I keep telling them that. I'm like, it's not in anywhere near. In fact, they put this big band-aid on it because I'm a physical therapist. Yes. Yeah, you go to physical therapy and they have you grab uh, marbles with your toes. Have you done that one? I haven't done that one yet. Oh, it's been bent. Oh, well, but you just try. Oh. Just keep trying, right? <laughs> and, and, and while you're grabbing marbles with your toes, they're getting 15 minutes of, of uh, billable yes. time, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. So try it at home. Just grab, grab some marbles and, and just grab them with your feet and try to pick them up from one place and move them to another and right. try to get those little toe muscles to do their thing. Yeah, I've been through all this myself. Yeah. What is it about hips that they say that they're, if the ones they're replaced, that they're only good for so long? Well, the titanium, I mean, there's only so long that a, a replacement. So a new knee, a new hip, we're getting better. But in, in the old days, they would usually say, you know, your body's looking at this is only going to be good for 10 years, right? And then you'll have to be looking at it again. Because now, they say that, like, you can only have, like, two hips in a lifetime or something like that. Is that? I've, I've not heard the limit. Oh, okay. But in the, I just know that in the past, they would say this is usually good for 10 years, okay. right? Um, and... Um, you know, they'll have you wait as long as possible to have the surgery done. Um, and maybe part of it is because they know there's a limited number of replacements. But the body rejects them a little bit, the, and the other bone structures can start to cause trouble over time. But typically, people would only have two in their lifetime. But I'm not sure there's a limit to that. Right? Any other comments or thoughts about the joints or bones at this point? Tell you what, let's go take a quick break now. And then we come back, we'll have the last hour and five minutes or so to move through on muscle. Okay, so some of these slides you're going to have already seen in lab. Uh, you know that there are criteria for naming muscles, that there are some Latin names, that there's some terms that you'll recognize here. Uh, again, uh, many of the muscles will tell you where in the body they're located, how many heads are on them, like the triceps or the biceps. Um, what they do, do they flex or extend, um, adduct or abduct, like we have the adductor longus in our list, and like the tibialis anterior must obviously be in front of the tibia. So there are definitely some meaning to the, the names of muscles. Also, muscles are in four basic patterns, and this term here, fascicle, I'll describe it to you in a minute, but a fascicle is a bundle or a group of muscle fibers. And in muscle, fiber is the same as a cell. So if you hear me say muscle fiber, it's the same as saying a muscle cell. Now, I know that's confusing because in the past, what was a fiber? Up until now, a fiber was a protein, right? Up until now, a fiber was a collagen fiber or an elastic fiber or a reticular fiber. And now I'm saying a fiber is an entire cell when we're discussing a muscle cell. So these cells travel or are in four basic different arrangements. One, sphincters, circular arrangements. So you've got uh, two sphincters on your list, right? The orbicularis oculi, the orbicularis oris. There are also sphincter muscles that control your digestive products. Your anus is a sphincter. So any kind of circular muscle is a sphincter. Uh, convergent, this is where the muscle fibers converge onto a localized area. For example, the pectoralis major, it converges, it comes from the sternum and goes over to, into the arm area, the armpit area, and it looks like a triangle. The third are the pennate, or sorry, the, the parallel. Parallel means that the, the muscle cells, the groups of cells, are running parallel to each other, and the biceps brachii has some of that characteristic to it. Uh, as do the rectus abdominis muscles, right? Very, very straight muscles. And then finally, there are the pennate muscles. And this is where you have one or more tendons, and the fibers look like they're coming off like a feather. And I'll show you a picture of these. Um, now, the muscles uh, were stuck with the names uh, back into... Uh, 1895, and they keep updating them a little bit, but we're still using the Latin names. And again, there are different tables and, and books and words for these, but you recognize already that the quadriceps, right, is a group of four muscles. So again, some of these meanings make sense. Now, we haven't had any leviters or profunduses this semester, so we don't need to worry about those. 
Here's a picture of these different muscle shapes and pretty self-explanatory. So a circular muscle, right, a sphincter. And then here are three different pennates. No matter what you see, you'll see it looks like a feather of some sort. So half a feather or two sides of a feather, or this is a really fancy one. And basically you have a tendon that's going down the middle of the muscle. The rectus femoris looks a lot like this from across the room. Here's a convergent muscle like the pectoralis major. Rectus abdominis would be parallel, as is the biceps brachii, but there's another term used here, and that is fusiform. Fusiform is any time something looks like this, right? It looks like it's a spindly kind of shaped structure. So that would be fusiform. The biceps brachii uh, have that classification as well. Again, you've seen these uh, terms before. You know the trapezoid shaped muscle of your back is the trapezius. Uh, if there's a major, there's going to be a minor. If there's a maximus, there's going to be a, a medius and a minimus. We may not have learned them all in our time together so far, but they're somewhere in the body. There's a pectoralis minor that you'll learn about next semester that's below and not as big as the pectoralis major. Um, I think the rest of these terms are pretty self-explanatory that we've seen before. Let's get into what's new here. Now, thankfully, we're only naming about 30 or so muscles in the body. The list that we're doing really isn't that extensive. There are over 700 named muscles in the body. So whereas we've learned pretty much all the bones, right? We're, we've got a few more bone markings to learn next semester, but you won't have many more bones to learn. The only new bones you'll learn next semester are the carpals and some of the other tarsals. Other than that, you know them. We'll learn a few more muscles next semester, but still our total number might be 50 or 60. So we're nowhere near from naming all of the muscles of the body. And that's a good thing, right? You're really thankful for that. This, what we've got is enough right now. And uh, muscle tissue is found all over the body. You know that muscle is specialized in moving things, uh, either the moving the skeleton or moving our digestive products, or pumping the blood through the heart, something like that. I'll be spending most of the time talking about skeletal muscle. Right? Skeletal muscle is the kind of muscle that moves our skeleton, and uh, that's what we'll spend most of our time. But if you think of a muscle as being an organ, again, if I hand you a biceps brachii muscle, you would be able to find within that muscle some muscle, some nerve, some epithelial and some connective tissue. So again, this idea that tissues combine to make organs uh, is continuing in our conversation. Skeletal muscle is that kind of muscle that's highly striated, lots and lots of stripes in it. And the cells themselves, which are called fibers, are actually many, many cells. It could be thousands of cells along a muscle fiber. So what happens is that during development, these little individual muscle cells are formed, but then they join hands, if you will, and they become one long cell. And this one long cell, the, the nuclei are maintained. And so skeletal muscle cells are said to be multi-nucleated because they have all of these nuclei along the length. When you look at cartoons here in a moment, you'll see that these cells have more than one nucleus. Think about the sartorius muscle. Right, starting up in the, in the thigh and going down, wrapping across your leg, that muscle can easily be eh, 18 inches long. And therefore, the muscle cells within the sartorius also are 18 inches long. So the muscle cells are as long as the muscle is. So very, very, very long cells when you're talking about skeletal muscle. Looking at a cartoon representation of this, you know your features of these muscle types. So skeletal muscle, again, you see the striping. What you're looking at here is just portions of three cells. So here's one cell. If I go, there's one cell, two cells, three cells. So you're only seeing a fraction of the cells, really long cells with the striping patterns. You can see also multinucleated. So there's a nucleus, there's a nucleus. So these are multinucleated cells. If you were going to tell me what are the characteristics of skeletal muscle, you all know that it's voluntary, and you know that it's striated, right? And it's connected to our um, bones. But you also could use the word discontinuous. Your biceps brachii, you don't, they don't have to keep moving, right? Your heart has to keep pumping, but your biceps brachii can take a rest. 
So it doesn't have to keep moving, so it's a discontinuous muscle. Uh, cardiac muscle, there are stripes as we see them, but there are also these intercalated discs. Now here the intercalated discs look like they were drawn by an Etch-a-Sketch. But regardless, there's still that extra line structure within the muscle. In the cardiac muscle in the middle? Yeah, yeah they're just showing you. Uh, it, it turns out that you, they do. The cardiac thing. muscle oftentimes is in Y shapes. And I'm not going to have you worry about that, but, but definitely it has more branching and more uh, spaces in between or, or funky arrangements of the cells. So there is definitely a bigger space between the nuclei than there is in skeletal muscle. You don't have multinucleated in the cardiac, right? Just one nucleus per cell. It's much shorter, right? The heart's not 18 inches long, so the heart's much, much shorter cells. Now, if you were going to describe the cardiac muscle, you could use the words, it's, it's very strong, it's very quick, that's similar to skeletal muscle, but the heart is definitely a continuous muscle, right? It has to keep on doing its job 24-7, and we know that the heart is involuntary. Finally, there's smooth muscle, uh, one nucleus per cell, and we're going to use that word fusiform again. Look at the shape of these cells. They look like long, spindly kind of shaped. So one word for the shape of a smooth muscle. I know I told you before they kind of look like little worms, and they do in a way. But you can appreciate that not only is the nucleus kind of worm shaped, but the entire cell is sort of spindly or worm shaped. And this is the, if this was the tortoise and the hare, this is the tortoise kind of muscle. Uh, it's relatively weak. It, it's very slow kind of muscle. It just keeps on doing its job, and it gets it done. But it's not very fast, and it, and it certainly isn't very strong. But smooth muscle just kind of keeps on doing its thing, pushing digestive products. Um, and we know, too, that this is involuntary muscle. So again, know the different characteristics of the three muscle types. I'm going to give you just a couple more details about cardiac and smooth muscle, and then the rest of our time will be on skeletal muscle. So cardiac muscle, uh, again, shorter fibers, uh, not as long. And uh, they do, uh, sometimes you'll have one, sometimes two nuclei, but normally just one nuclei. And there is a lot of this branching. So you'll see some Y-shaped branching in the muscle cells. But that's not really that important to me. What, what are you going to look for to recognize cardiac muscle? Yeah, those intercalated discs. That's really what you want to focus on is that there are these intercalated discs. That's the key term for cardiac muscle, right? The intercalated discs. Now, cardiac muscle is autorhythmic, which means that it just keeps on pumping. In fact, you can disconnect the heart from the, the brain, and the heart will keep on pumping. If you've ever seen a heart transplant kind of show, and the person is clinically dead, and the heart is sitting there pumping, and they'll take the heart out, and they'll put it into an ice bath, and, and they'll keep it alive, but all they do is shock it again, and it will start beating again. It does not need the brain or the nervous system to send the signal. The heart has what's called the pacemaker. We'll deal with that next semester, but the heart has its own way of initiating its own signal, and when that signal no longer works, then we're able nowadays to give someone an artificial pacemaker to keep their heart pumping. So here's that cartoon view. Um, I wouldn't have you recognize this by the cartoon. But again, you see the striped patterns. But then these little squiggles are the intercalated discs. And you can see that these cells tend to form Y branches. And you wouldn't see that in skeletal muscle. Then just a couple of things about smooth muscle. Again, these cells are said to be fusiform in shape. So there's that term. Again, that's a cell that kind of has a shape like a, some sort of long spindly thing like a worm. Um, I'm not going to talk about this thin and thick filament story very much this semester. So some of this isn't going to be that critical to you as you read through this. Um, so the, the facts that I have here about the transverse tubules, that you can, you can forget about the transverse tubules. Don't worry about that. You can not worry about the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And um, don't worry about the dense body. So some of the features I'm giving here aren't going to be important for you this semester. 
just know that there are no striations, right? There's no striations, and um, that's what you want to know. No striations in smooth muscle. Now, this is the kind of muscle that contracts slowly, it, uh, but the good news is it's resistant to fatigue. So smooth muscle just kind of keeps on going, right? It's, it's, the, it's the tortoise. Keeps on going, doesn't get tired, just moves along. And uh, because it is slower to fatigue and not as quick and not as powerful, it also requires less energy. So it doesn't require as much ATP. It requires less energy than either cardiac or skeletal muscle. Also, smooth muscle, remember, is involuntary. So again, here's that fusiform shape. And this is actually each cell, right? Remember you said that, we, we said that smooth muscle looks like little parasites. Uh, and, and so we still have this idea of parasitic shape. Okay, everything else is gonna be about good old skeletal muscle. And um, what does skeletal muscle do for us? Well, clearly it's moving our body, it's moving our skeleton, it's maintaining our posture. But don't forget that when you're cold, what do you do? You get up and move, right? And you're shivering. And so that, that reaction, too, is your skeletal muscles. And um, we also have some sphincters that are skeletal muscles. Name for me your voluntary sphincters. Right? We can blank, orbicularis oculi. We can choose to talk and eat, right? Orbicularis orus, and then also the anus is voluntary. So those are definitely voluntary sphincter muscles that um, we can think about. Now the other circular muscles in the body are going to be involuntary. Right? There are going to be some other sphincters along the digestive tract that we don't have control over, but we definitely have control over the orbicularis orus and the anus uh, as you think about digest digestion. And then, of course, we also have lots of muscles providing support. Think about your abdominal region. There are no bones protecting your stomach. You instead have layer after layer after layer of muscles in the abdominal region. So muscles can also be protective, not just your bones. If I were to say, what are the characteristics of epithelial tissues? What would you tell me? Going back a little bit to, to our tissues, but... What are the characteristics of epithelial tissues? Tightly packed cells, avascular, right? Always sitting on top of connective tissue. What are the, what are the characteristics of connective tissues? Loosely packed cells with ground substance and fibers, right? Protein fibers. Now, if I were to say, what are the characteristics of muscle tissue? Now we look at this list. Muscle tissue is excitable. That is, it can be turned on, it can be, be uh, activated by the nervous system, by electrical signals. Number two, it, when it is activated, when it is excited, it contracts, it shortens. That's what muscle does, right? It gets shorter. But it also has the ability of being elastic, which means that it can go back to its original shape, right? So muscles are contracted, but then they have to go back to where they were in the beginning and then finally, muscle is extensible. Now, these two words give us a little bit of trouble, but extensible means, for example, when I am flexing my biceps brachii, what's happening to my triceps brachii? So as my biceps are shortening, right, I'm telling it to shorten, what is happening to my, my triceps are actually lengthening. They are extensing, right? So muscles, so, so as, I, as I flex my biceps, they're elastic. They can return back to their original shape. But also, as my triceps and biceps are working against each other, the other group is extensing as well. It's, it's being stretched, if you will, when the other muscle is doing its job. So we've got these characteristics of muscle. It's electrically uh, stimulatable. It's excitable. It's, contract, it's contractile. It can return to its original shape, and it can cooperate by extending its length when other muscles are working, and that's this idea of extensibility.
Now, I've already told you in lab that muscles rarely work completely alone. Muscles are always interacting with other muscles. They are interacting um, as groups. The two groups we know are the hamstrings and the, and the quadriceps femoris group. We get that. Three muscles in the hamstrings, four muscles in the quadriceps femoris groups. The muscle that does most of the work is going to be called the agonist or the prime mover. right? And we're, it's kind of like literature terms here. So the agonist is the guy in the white hat. Right? And the guy who poses the agonist is the antagonist, right? And so the antagonist is the muscle that does the opposing work, the muscle in the black hat. Then the synergist would be everything that helps along. So uh, synergy is when two things do better alone, uh, together than they could alone. So synergist muscles would be contributing. So let's say we're thinking about the rectus femoris. The rectus femoris is the prime mover of the quadriceps group, but what are the other synergists? The vastuses, right? The three vastuses are assisting the rectus femoris, so they are considered synergist muscles within the group. And then what group is considered antagonistic? The hamstring, right? The hamstring muscles, the semitendinosus, the semimembranosus, and the biceps femoris, those muscles would be considered antagonistic. So hopefully most of that is, is somewhat familiar to you. Now, where I'm going to dive in right now, the next 10 slides or so are going to be brand new for you. So it's time to perk up just for a little bit. And we're going to dive in and understand what, what is muscle made up of? How is it structurally put together from an anatomical standpoint? So again, this is skeletal muscle. So what we're going to see is that every muscle is like an organ. And therefore, there are going to be muscle and nervous and epithelial and connective tissues within the muscle. And we're going to break those areas up. Now, the muscle will be further divided up into fascicles. Now, we know from our vocab that fasci meant a band or a bundle. So it's a bundle of muscle cells. So a bundle of muscle cells is called a fascicle. Okay. And um, within each muscle fiber, that is within each muscle cell, there are going to be many myofibrils. And the myofibrils themselves are made up of myofilaments. Now, that's a lot of myo F words, right? So hold on. Let me, let me break this down for, for you as we look into this story. There's also going to be three layers of connective tissue in or on or around or within a muscle. These layers are called the endomysium. You might hear endomyceum in pronunciation. I just say the myceum. So the endomysium, uh, this is the innermost layer. You know that endo means within. So the endomysium is the innermost layer. Remember, the endoderm is the innermost layer of your tissues. The endomysium is the innermost layer of connective tissue. And this endomysium is going to support and surround each individual muscle cell. Then there's a layer called the perimesium. And the perimesium, peri means what? Around, but the question is around what? The perimesium is a layer of connective tissue around the fascicles. And then there's epimesium. And epimesium, epi we know means on or upon. So epimesium is on the entire muscle, on the outside. So I'll show you pictures of these as we figure out this whole thing. Um, so let's take a look at this. We know this is the good old femur, right? And we see the tendon. Remember the tendon? That dense, regular connective tissue that connects a muscle to a bone. And then the tendon is continuous with the deep fascia. I had mentioned that to you in lab. But this is even in addition to that. In addition to the tendon, in addition to the deep fascia, there's also the epimesium. Again, that means on. So on the entire muscle, layered on the outside, would be a layer of the epimesium. That's in addition to the deep fascia. Then we see that the muscle itself is made up of these bundles. So each thing that I'm circling now is a fascicle. And each fascicle is surrounded by a layer called the perimesium, a layer of connective tissue. And then 
So that what's so what's sticking out right here? What I'm circling? That is a that's a fascicle, right? Okay, so that's a fascicle. It's a bundle of cells. So that means that this thing sticking out is a cell. That is a muscle cell, aka muscle fiber. All right, so that's a fiber sticking out right there, or a muscle cell. So what would be wrapped around the fascicle? Did you spell fascicle wrong or is it spelled wrong in our Oh, I may have spelled it wrong here. It's right in your book. It has two C's. No. And slide. Yes, there are two C's. Yes, yes, but not, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a fascicle there. Now, what would be around the fascicle? The perimesium. The perimesium, right, would be touching the outside of the fascicle, wouldn't it? And then what would be wrapped around the muscle fiber? Some endomesium, okay? So whatever it takes for you to see that. I'm going to show you a couple more of these images to get this figured out for you. So here's what I just said in words, written down for you. So we'll start on the outside layer. That's the epimesium. Again, it's covering the entire muscle, right? The whole muscle is covered by the epimesium. Then those bundles within the muscle called the fascicles, right? The fascicles are surrounded by perimesium. And then each and every muscle cell or muscle fiber, right? is going to be surrounded by the endomesium. Let's take a look at this image. Let's start off with bones. What bone is this? Let's see humerus, right? We recognize it has a, a rounded head up here, not as, um, nowhere near as big as the, as the uh, femur for sure. And we see the tendon coming off. And then we see that layer called the deep fascia. In addition to that, the entire muscle has this layer coming off called the epimesium. Then this circle is a, this whole thing is a fascicle. So surrounding the fascicle would be what? Perimesium. And then what's sticking out here is a muscle cell or a muscle fiber, and it would have around it some endomesium. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce what these guys are. Those are, and we'll come back and look at it in a second, but I want to label it here. Those are myofibrils. What's sticking out? It's like a bunch of straws sticking in straws, stuck in straws. And, and it takes a moment to get the layers figured out. But what's sticking out down here? Those are myofibrils. They're actually filling up the muscle cell. Now, I've already introduced this term deep fascia as well. So if there's a major, there must be a minor. If there's a deep fascia, there must be a what? Superficial fascia. I right, say that five times. All right. There must be a superficial fascia. If there's a deep, there must be a superficial. So let's figure out what this term means. And I think you're going to have an aha moment here in a second. So we'll come back and look at these layers again. But right now, I want you to see that in addition to the three connective tissue layers, the epi, the uh, uh, peri, and the uh, endomesium, there's also the deep fascia. Let's take a look at superficial fascia. You already know this. The superficial fascia you know as the hypodermis or as the subcutaneous layer of the skin. Okay. So let's take a look at this picture and figure out this idea of fascia. This is what surgeons spend years learning, that your body is made up of layers. And they need to know what layer they are in as they start to pull layer after layer off. These layers or fascia, these, these layers. Now, if we're looking at the leg here, we've got a, a cut through the femur, through the thigh. And the yellow, right, is the superficial fascia. You know it as the fat layer under your skin, right? So that's nothing more than the hypodermis. And then here's the femur in the very center. And there are muscles around the femur. Now, I'm not going to 
care which one's the quadriceps group and which one's the hamstring groups and some of the other muscles. But now, what's the deep fascia? The deep fascia is the layer that surrounds the entire muscle. What allows your muscles to slide over each other as they're doing their work, right? Each muscle is completely surrounded by the deep fascia. And this deep fascia allows the muscles to slide over each other so we can have movement. Does that make sense? So now let's think about if you were going to take a, a, a needle and just start going through your skin, what would the layers be? Yeah, it'd be epidermis. And I won't go back and review all the layers of that. We don't need to worry about that right now. But there'd be the stratum corneum and the granulosum and all that. And then you would get down to the dermis, that your regular connective tissue where all the hair follicles and the blood vessels are. And then you would get down to the hypodermis, which we can also call the, right, the superficial fascia, right? And then you would be at the level of the muscle. But what would be the first thing we would see in the muscle? Deep fascia, right? And then, going straight into a muscle, what would we see? Then we would see the epimesium. Then, that's over the whole muscle. Then we would get down to some fascicles and we come across some perimesium. And if we're diving down toward an individual muscle cell, then we would find some endomesium. And then finally, we would be at the muscle fiber, right, at the muscle cell. So can you appreciate just kind of thinking about those layers from outside to in, from superficial to deep, going down? So the arteries and the veins are the The arteries and the veins are actually protected within those connective tissue layers. So in this picture, you can appreciate it. Again, red and blue, arteries and veins, yellow nerves. And you can see that those arteries and veins and nerves are traveling, some of them, between the muscles, and some of them between the muscle cells, and sometimes between the fascicles. But these connective tissue layers are allowing a place, a space, for blood vessels and nerves to travel down into the depths of our muscles. So let's, let's pull this apart, the next three or four pictures. So I know where I am because it tells me. And you'll always have a clue. So what, what level of complexity am I in? Well, it tells me that this layer is the endomesium. So I must be where? I'm way down. I am, that layer is around the entire muscle cell. So that means that this is a muscle cell. Man, that doesn't look like a cell, right? It, it just doesn't look like a cell that we've labeled in the past. But it is. That's the muscle fiber or the muscle cell. Now, what do we see that it's stuffed in here? The muscle cell is stuffed with these things called myofibrils. A couple of slides ago, I labeled that myofibril just so you had continuity of your images. Now, do you see that the myofibril has stripes? I see those striping, the dark and light patterns. So when you look at skeletal muscle and you see striations, right, you're seeing some of this evidence of these dark and light banding patterns. Also notice that within this cell, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Lots of nuclei, right? So multi, <coughs> excuse me, multinucleated cell. Okay, so that entire thing is a muscle fiber, a muscle cell. It has around it a layer of endomesium. And within the muscle cell, we have a lot of myofibrils. We'll come back and visit those briefly. Let's zoom out a little bit. Okay, if I show this to you enough times, you'll start getting the hang of this. So I know, because it tells me, that this is a what? This is the entire muscle cell. So what would be hanging out right here on the outside? Superficial Endomesium, right, around the muscle cell. Many muscle cells cluster together in a fascicle. So that entire thing is a fascicle, and it would be surrounded by perimesium. And notice, right, so, so what are these layers here? What's this? I'm drawing what? I'm drawing on top of what? That's endomesium, right? Each of those muscle cells is surrounded by endomesium. And notice that there's a blood vessel right there. There's a blood vessel right there. So there's some blood vessels that are able to travel through these connective tissue layers. 
Let's zoom out one more time. So there's my muscle fiber. There's my muscle cell. Many cells cluster in a group called a fascicle. That would be surrounded by peri, right? Perimesium. All the fascicles together make up the entire muscle. The muscle would be surrounded by epimesium. In addition to the epimesium, what's this layer back here? Yeah, that's deep fascia. And then the deep fascia is continuous with what? That's the tendon. Okay? So the deep fascia is continuous with that tendon that would then attach to the bone. So what's the light pink stuff with the myo that's between the myofibrils? Between the myofibrils in here? Yeah, like that light. Cytoplasm. Right? So you're inside the cell. So the question was, okay, so what's all the stuff inside between these little tiny myofibrils? Each of those is a little myofibril, right? And that would be the cytoplasm inside the cell. That would be some nerve, or that could also be a different kind of cell called a satellite cell. And I'm not going to discuss those this semester, but satellite cells are like stem cells for your muscle. So when you damage a muscle, it's possible for your skeletal muscle to regenerate to a certain extent. Those satellite cells are not in cardiac muscle. So when you have a heart attack and you damage the heart muscle, it does not regenerate. It's, you're stuck with the damage, right? Whereas if you damage a skeletal muscle, there is some regeneration possible because you have some of these cells hanging around that can regenerate. Okay, so we know this term. We know what a tendon is, right? It's a connective tissue structure made of what sort of connective tissue? A tendon is made up of, we know this, dense regular. regular, right? Dense regular. And a tendon connects a muscle to a bone, but there are also other structures. Having a little weight here on my iPad. So we have tendons, but then there's also, uh, what's a ligament? A ligament connects a... A ligament connects a bone to a bone, right? Tendon connects muscle to bone. And tendons are usually very cord-like structures. Tendons are usually very thick. They're very cord-like. You've seen them in the lab. They're always white. And why are tendons always white? They're not completely, but they're almost avascular, right? So they're very, very white, very little blood flow. Sorry, my, my iPad's not happy right now. Now, there's also a structure called an aponeurosis. Now, an aponeurosis is a flattened sheet of tendon. And there's two aponeuroses. You didn't have to name any of them, but you've seen them in the lab on the models. If you look across the rectus abdominis, across the abdominal muscle, you see a white sheet. That's an aponeurosis. It connects the muscles to other muscles. There's also an aponeurosis that goes across the top of the skull. And it connects the muscles of your forehead to the muscles of the back of your head and allows you to kind of move your scalp around a little bit. So an aponeurosis is a flattened sheet of tendon-like material, still made up of dense regular, okay, the same kind of stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at these pictures and, and let's make sure we've got this down as far as these layers. So what am I looking at here? I know. I think the Wi-Fi is, is uh, weak right now. So in the very top image, what do I have? I see a, it says it's a fascicle, right? So, okay, I can read. So what does that mean? I'm looking at a group of, each of those therefore is a what? Muscle cell or muscle fiber. And the entire fascicle would be surrounded by a layer called the paramecium. 
And again, we see that these layers allow a space for blood vessels and nerves to run next to the muscle cells. On the bottom, that is a close-up of a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. Again, I, I know it because it tells me, but if that wasn't labeled, if this wasn't here, I still know that it's a muscle cell because it's telling me that there's a layer of endomesium surrounding it. Right? So there's always going to be a clue. If, if this were high school, I would probably, and you may want to do this, I would probably have you make a model of muscle. And I'd have you go around and collect straws. And you'd go to McDonald's. And they had those big, fat, yellowish, red striped straws, right? Big, fat straws in McDonald's. And then I'd have you go someplace else that had skinnier straws. And you would kind of shove some skinnier straws in the big straw. And then you might go get some coffee stirs or something really, really thin or some toothpicks and stick those in there. And you could sort of create your own little model of muscle and name each of those layers and then rubber band a whole bunch of those together to make an entire muscle, right? Imagine that, right? Just imagine you're, you're creating straws within straws within straws because that's really what it looks like at the first few times you look at this. And it will come into focus for you, I know. The, the other concept that you've already seen in lab is origins and insertions. Okay, origins and insertions. What do we know about this? What do you know about origins and insertions? Yeah, so, so let's back up even further. So you've got hundreds of muscles. Your muscles move your skeleton. The reason they can move your skeleton because every muscle is attached to a certain combination of bones. And so that when your muscle contracts, it's going to shorten and pull bones in one direction or another, right? So every muscle is going to have an origin and an insertion, maybe multiple origins and multiple insertions. And an origin, by definition, is going to be the area that is least movable, right? The lesser movable area is going to be the origin. And the insertion is going to be the more movable place. And what happens is that during contraction, when the bones move, the insertion is always going to move toward the origin. The insertion will move toward the origin. The less movable place will move, or sorry, the more movable place will move toward the less movable place. So let's use, there were six of these that you wanted to know a little bit more about for the lab practical. Let's just use the biceps brachii as a simple example. What do we know about this muscle? Biceps, right? Two heads, two tendons, and where do they attach? Yeah, so, again, sorry. So we're looking at the biceps brachii. So the two, there are two tendons that, that bring this. This is really frustrating. Sorry, guys. What I'm seeing on my iPad is not what's on the screen, which is the first time this has happened. I think the Wi-Fi signal in the room is dying. And I'm letting it. Trying to let us catch up, right? I don't have the patience. OK, so let's just look at this image while it's there. OK, so what do we have? So we've got a two-headed muscle. It's in the brachium, the biceps brachii. The origin is up in the shoulder region. You learned on your list that it's actually more specifically where? Yeah, up in the glenoid cavity. Makes sense. It's up in the shoulder. And where is its insertion? Down on the? Radial tuberosity, right? That insertion place on the radius. So we've got that. And um, as you flex the bicep, as the bicep contracts, the arm is going to flex. It's going to decrease its angle. The radius will be, and the entire antebrachium will be pulled toward the shoulder. So the origin is the less movable place, right? And the insertion is the greater moving place that moves toward the origin upon contraction. So that's the general you know, uh, way that we think about origins and insertions. 
Now you've also seen blood vessels and nerves traveling through these different pictures. And sure enough, um, as you saw, the blood vessels and the nerves are able to extend through those connective tissue layers, through the epimesium, through the perimesium. Remember that every muscle cell needs its oxygen, right? Every muscle cell needs to get a blood supply. So we have to have blood supply going down to every single cell. We need ATP, right? Uh, muscle contraction, as we'll learn a lot more next semester, is very, very energy uh, needy. And you have to have a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients for the body to make lots of ATP. Remind me, what organelle makes ATP? Mitochondria. So you would expect to see a really high number of mitochondria also inside a muscle cell. That makes sense, right? So not only would you uh, have all these myofibrils, but there would also be a very high number of mitochondria. Remember, too, that uh, muscle cells are very metabolic. That means that they're producing a lot of waste products. Those waste products also have to be taken away from the muscles, and we take away waste products also through the blood. So again, we have to have lots of blood flow to the muscle, and that's why when you look at muscle, what color is it? It's red, right? I mean, it's, it's a lot of blood flow going to your muscles. Now, we know that our skeletal muscle is considered voluntary because our nervous system controls it. This is where we're heading when we come back after the test next Monday. Next Wednesday, we'll be starting with the nervous system. And we'll learn how is it that when we think about it, how is it that we're told, telling the muscles to work. And we'll, we're going to spend the greatest amount of time that we're ever going to spend on any unit, we're going to spend a lot of time on the nervous system. We've got five chapters on the nervous system. And we've got to learn about the, the overall nervous system. We have to learn about the brain. We have to learn about the spinal cord. We have to learn about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. So we have a lot to do when we get back really related to the nervous system. And your lab next week is on the nervous system. So we're, we're, we're pretty much in synchrony uh, between the lecture and the lab. Now, the, the kinds of the, the nervous system is going to send signals down the spinal cord and out to your muscles. And these neurons, these cells that carry the electrical signals, are going to be called motor neurons. When you hear the word motor, you think what? Movement, right? So motor neurons are, are nerve cells that are sending instructions to move your body. So moving your skeletal muscle is what they're going to be doing. So again, your muscles have to have a lot of nerves. They have to have a lot of blood vessels. And that's why I'm telling you about that, because they travel through those layers. Now, this is what's incredible to me. And that is that every single muscle cell in your body has to be directly and individually connected to your nervous system. Every single muscle cell has a direct connection to your nervous system. It's not like we've got a wire that comes down and touches our biceps, brachii, and tells it to flex. Right? Every single muscle cell within the muscle is individually and directly innervated, connected to the nervous system. So we'll be dealing with that whole complexity uh, when we get together after the next test. The skeletal muscle cell is a little bit different right, than what we've seen before. The cell uh, has a couple of extra terms associated with it. When we were in chapter three and we talked about cells, we talked about uh, plasma membrane. We mentioned uh, cytoplasm. And there's a couple of replacement terms here. Not really hard. Whenever you see the word sarco, sarco is another abbreviation that means muscle. So sarco this, sarco that. Sarcolemma, have we gotten a lemma yet And our vocab? Did we just get there today? Or is it next time? OK, next time. But we're going to learn it now. So lemma means a, a layer or a rind or a peel, literally. So the sarcolemma is the layer around the muscle cell. You would call it the plasma membrane right, of the muscle cell. Just a special name, the sarcolemma. Inside a cell, you would normally call it the cytoplasm. OK, instead, we're going to call it a sarcoplasm. Not hard. 
Now the other terms on here, the T-tubule term, I'm not going to worry about because we're not going to discuss that this semester and likewise the sarcoplasmic reticulum. We're not going to worry about those terms at all this semester. Now I've mentioned myofibrils. Okay, now this, is, this gets a little confusing because these terms are so similar. Within the sarcoplasm of a muscle cell, you've seen me label it twice, that it is full of these straw-like structures called myofibrils. And a myofibril is this long structure. It goes the entire length of the muscle cell. So myofibrils are as long as the muscle cell is long. Oops. Okay, so a myofibril is as long as the cell is, and what you're going to see is that uh, within a myofibril, you have these shorter bundles of myofilaments. Where have you heard that word filament before? Let's try to make sense of this word filament. Where have you heard the word filament, at least until a few years ago in your home? You don't talk about that in your home, do you? Light bulbs, right? Right? Tungsten filaments. I just, <laughs> it's okay. But I want, when you hear the word filament, I want you to think of very, very narrow little structure, right? Very, very small, right? So filaments are very, very small. And so what we see is that the myofibrils themselves are made up of bundles of these shorter myofilaments, these very, very small structures. So let's say a muscle cell goes across the room. Right, so a muscle cell is 25 feet wide. Within that muscle cell, myofibrils would also be 25 feet wide. So they go the entire length within the cell. But within that myofibril, there would be hundreds or thousands of these myofilaments making it up. Let me show you a picture of it. And this is going down now to the truly the protein level of the muscle, down to the, the smallest area. Your myofibrils, your myofilaments come in basically two types, the thin filaments and the thick filaments, thick and thin. The thin filament is actually a protein called actin, okay? Actin is the protein, so it ends in I-N, a good clue that it is, in fact, a protein. And there's a few extra details here, but right now I'm going to have you ignore tropomyosin and troponin. I just want you to know what's above this line. That is that it is a uh, thin filament. It's in a twisted shape. It looks like a bunch of uh, beads on a string. And this thin filament is going to be binding to another protein called myosin. Myosin is the thick filament. Okay, just it's a bigger molecule. So that's the thick filament. And myosin is going to bind to the actin. It's twice as big, and it kind of looks like a bunch of golf clubs straddling together. Now, when you look at skeletal muscle and you see the striations within skeletal muscle, what you're actually seeing now are the overlapping arrangements of the actin and myosin proteins. So we'll see a picture of that here in a second. So on the top, that entire structure in the upper left is a myofibril. So where are we? If that's a myofibril up there, where are we? We're looking at, there would be hundreds of these, right? There would be hundreds of these squeezed into a muscle cell, right? Myofibrils. And for the first time, in this myofibril, what's sticking out? Some myofilaments. That's the first time myofilaments have been labeled anywhere. So they're the smallest structures. 
and myofilaments come in two flavors, thin and thick. So the top molecule, the red twisted string, that is the actin molecule. That's the thin filament. The bottom one in yellow with the golf club looking like a bunch of golf clubs, that is the thick filament, the myosin. And these two molecules are going to slide over each other and are going to uh, uh, cause the actual contraction of the muscle. That's what gives it the dark and light appearance, absolutely. So when you look at striations, you're actually seeing overlapping areas of greater density of these fibers and lesser density of these fibers. Now, when you look under the microscope, you see the, the striations. These striations have been further characterized as banding patterns. And there's a few letters here that I want you to appreciate. Uh, the A band. And the A band is wherever there is the thick filament. So I think of A as being sort of a broad, thick letter. And so wherever the A, the A band is what makes up the thick filament, the myosin. There's also the I band. I is a skinny letter. So the I band is only where there are the thin filaments. Now, the, 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 the thick filaments, they're bigger. So they're going to give a, a darker appearance. The thin filaments are lighter. They're going to give a lighter color appearance as well. So again, we're talking about those light and dark banding patterns that you see in skeletal muscle. There's an H zone. You'll see that in a second. And there's also an M line. Good thing M is right down the middle. Easy to remember. There's also the Z line, or what's called the Z disc. And these are each end of these areas. So. Pictures are a lot easier to describe than these words. You can cross off connectin and cross off titan. I'm not going to worry about those terms this semester. So cross off connectin, cross off titan. So this is what we've got going on. Um, imagine that muscle cell going across the entire room. And at top, you've got a cartoon representation of actin and myosin. The yellow are the myosins, right? the thick filaments. The red are the thin filaments. And you can see that they're overlapping with each other. Now imagine you were taking a picture of this with a microscope, and you would see what's on the bottom. You'd see the dark and light patterns. Where you see, right, where you see a lot of the myosin and actin overlapping, is where you see a darker band under the microscope. And where there are fewer things overlapping, there's a lighter area of color. So you're just appreciating that you're seeing light and dark banding patterns based upon the overlapping actins and myosins. The Z disks that I mentioned are these squiggles on the side. So there's a Z disk, and there's a Z disk. Now, within your muscle, you have thousands and thousands of these arrangements. And each of these arrangements is called, and I want you to know this term, sarcomere. What is mere? Or mer? Mere or mer? What's a polymer? Polymer is a molecule made up of many parts. A monomer is a molecule made up of only one part. So that means a sarcomere or sarcomere is what? Part of a muscle, right? So this is the, the, the microscopic part of the muscle that does all the work of a muscle. And it's called a sarcomere. And a sarcomere is defined as going from Z to Z. So this is one sarcomere. And you've got a group of these overlapping actins and myosin molecules. Now, I'm going to do, um, I, I want you to see this picture. Not that I'm going to have you label it, but I want you to appreciate this because it shows us something that we haven't seen yet. We're now looking at a myofibril. A myofibril is what's sticking across the, the screen. And the myofibril is itself made up of, of interlocking end-to-end -end sarcomeres. So there's a sarcomere here, right? And then there's a sarcomere right next to it, and another sarcomere, and another sarcomere, and another sarcomere. 
And what happens is when muscle contracts, every sarcomere within that muscle will shorten. And as all of these actins and myosin slide over each other, and as the entire muscle shortens, then the muscle will contract. So the sarcomere then is this functional unit, this functional unit of the muscle. So just know this term sarcomere and know that it's defined as going from Z to Z on the images. Every myofibril is composed of multiple Z discs and there are many, many sarcomeres within each myofibril. Do the myosin and actins get shorter? Do the actin and myosin molecules get shorter? If my fingers are actins and myosins, then my thumbs would be the Z discs, right? So as the actins and myosins slide over each other, the entire sarcomere is getting close, uh, smaller, isn't it? But my fingers aren't changing their length. So that's what's happening when your muscle contracts. The actins and myosins are sliding over each other. They themselves are not changing their length, but the sarcomere itself is shortening as the muscle contracts. Now, I just want to give you a couple of, of highlights here. And so what I tell you to focus on, focus on. What I tell you to skip over, skip over. You're looking at a relaxed muscle on the side. You see the overlapping. Um, actins and myosins, and they're going to slide over each other. There's three images here that show you what you would see under the microscope as different muscles are contracting. So that's a relaxed muscle, and then you can imagine that muscle becoming contracted, and now the actins and myosins are going to be sliding over each other, and as they do, the muscle's getting shorter, and it would look different under the microscope as well. And then a fully contracted muscle, right? Every, every actin and myosins have squeezed together. They've slid over each other to their maximum, and there's no more sliding possible. The muscle is now as tight as it can possibly be. It is generating as much force as it possibly can, and that's when you, you know, you've gone as far as you can go. Now, here's where I'm going to skip. We're not going to worry about neuromuscular junctions, so skip that slide. We're not going to worry about this image the next one, or any of this. We're going to skip over to the kitty cat, OK? And all I want you to know is that no animals were harmed in the making of this picture. And this little kitty cat, OK, is in a state of rigor mortis. And that means that after death, or at least where I'm assuming that's what this is, or it's just a cute kitty that's stretching, right? <laughs> but, but what happens is that after death, the body goes into a state of rigor. And what happens is that the muscles start to contract, and then they can't relax. And then it slowly goes away. And what's really going on is that after death, there's no more ATP available. And ATP is necessary for your muscles to contract. ATP is also necessary for your muscles to relax. So after death, when ATP is no longer available, the muscles begin to contract, but then they get stuck there. And then they don't relax for about another two days or so when the body starts to break down even further. So we'll stop with the, the word rigor mortis here, skip over those slides in between, and then the last thing I want you to look at, skip over everything else here, nothing, 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 not at all, go to the very, very end, and I just again want you to appreciate what's going to happen as this muscle or the muscular system ages, and I'm brought to the last slide or two, and that is that with age, we will lose some skeletal mass, skeletal muscle mass. Our, our power and size of our muscles will decrease. The muscle that we lose will be replaced with fat, with adipose. Not only will our skeletal muscles decrease in their function, but also our cardiac muscle would also decrease. And so we could have issues with our circulation. Our muscles will recover. Uh, they'll take longer to recover. And they'll, they'll fatigue more quickly. So after a 20-year-old runs a marathon, right, it's a lot easier to recover than after a 50-year-old runs a marathon. And the elasticity of the muscles also decrease. And then I'll just leave you with this picture. Um, 
I used to think this, this was a, a Photoshop picture that until about three years ago, four years ago, my first year working at MSU at the College of Medicine, I had a student say to me, that's my high school gym teacher. And I've forgotten his name. He was definitely a big old steroid user. He was a middle school PE teacher for her. He wore these big T-shirts, and he was some, you know, Mr. Universe, you know, kind of guy. And he died of, of cancer that was brought on by the steroids that he was shooting up for many, many years to look like this. And there's a, he has a website, and I've got to find it, because Kara, my student, sent me to this website, said, yeah, look, this, this, is, this guy's not Photoshop. This is him. And he had a website also about the, the, the dangers of anabolic steroids and showed him dying, you know, weathered away to nothing in his hospital bed uh, moment, days before he died. And um, um, anyway, I just always thought that was truly a Photoshop picture, but apparently that's the real dude um, at one point. So... Hmm. So listen, I know we skipped over quite a bit at the end, and that's okay. Hopefully this recording went okay. I know there's some hiccups. I'm hoping the hiccups were more problematic here than they were on the recording. I know my voice was recorded. Maybe the pictures didn't always stay in sync. Um, the test on Monday will cover again the, the bones, the joints, and the muscle conversation that we had today. You are not responsible for any muscles or bone markings that we haven't already done in lab. So on Monday, we'll do that. And then on Wednesday, we'll get started with the nervous system.